Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of the Marketing from the Trenches podcast. My name's Will, and I'm your host for today's episode, as I am for most episodes. Uh, for today, I've got my friend and my colleague, because we've done a lot of work together, Dan Ratner from Uber Brand on the podcast. So Dan is an amazing, amazing brand marketer. He's worked with really fast growing or super fast growing startups, I should say, all the way through to really big enterprise clients. In fact, his agency and his team have worked with one of the biggest education companies in Australia and currently expanding and doing a lot of great work for clients internationally uh, in the US as well. So Dan has a really unique approach to branding and his approach is how do you use branding to increase performance of your marketing and your campaigns. So it's a really interesting concept. You know, we've been doing a lot of work with him uh, recently in terms of merging direct and merging branding, which is kind of two separate entities of marketing and making sure that all the campaigns you get into the market hit all levels of the funnel and really generate some awesome, awesome results. So I think you get a lot from this episode. We go into a whole framework about how to build a brand and use that brand to drive lower cost for acquisitions and more acquisitions and clients. Uh, so we'll dive straight into it. There's a whole bunch of resources that Dan actually shares with us on the episode as well. So you find them in the show notes and let's get into it and I'll see you in the episode itself. Hey guys, and another episode of Marketing from the Trenches podcast. I've got my good mate and uh, you know, how would you describe our working relationship, Dan? <laughs> Actually, we do quite a bit. Mate. We do quite a bit of work together. Um, you know, uh, really excited to bring Dan into the podcast because Dan is one of the best branding marketers I've ever come across, which is probably why we do so much work together, to be honest. And uh, you know, Dan's got an agency that does a whole bunch of branding and they're moving into performance as well. So I won't still too much of your thunder, Dan. I'll let you do a bit of an intro about who you are, uh, what you do, and you know, tell us a little bit about you. I don't know. Well, that was a pretty, uh, a pretty good introduction. So thank you. I didn't realize I was one of the best marketers, brand marketers that the, uh, you've come across, but really I'll take that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we're a, uh, we're, we're, Uber brand is a, a branding communications agency and really what we're looking to do is build brands that actually perform in market. I think what you're finding, and I'm sure you said it as well, Will, you're finding all, all these organizations are either really focused on producing something beautiful at one end or producing something very sales orientated at the other. We really need to bring these two things together because essentially what you do and say in market is your brand. And we want to make sure that what you say and what you do in market is a deep reflection of who and what you are from the get go. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think, look, I think that's one of the reasons why, why we, why we kind of go along so, so well, because you know, you're, you're obviously from, from, from branding universe. I'm from the direct marketing universe and at times or in the past, it was completely different, right? You either did branding or you did direct. So, you know, when we started talking, then I was like, man, this branding guy is understanding how direct works. It was yeah. like, oh, cool. That's, <laughs> that's very different. What a lot of people are saying. So, um, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's cool that you're thinking that way. And I, I really like it as well. So, you know, I think with this podcast, um, what I'm trying to do is really dive into stuff that's working at the moment, which is kind of why it's called marketing from the trenches. And you've got a really, really cool client portfolio. So if you don't mind, you know, if you don't mind talking about some of your clients, um, you know, and what you've done for them, I think it'd be really good for the people to just get an idea that this isn't, you know, huge companies. So yeah, no worries. All right. Yeah. Well why don't we talk about some of the, the more, the more interesting sort of startup companies that, that we've worked with. Um, and I might, and I might pick off the, the power company that we've, we've recently taken to market. So if I start that story from the beginning, um, it's a company called power club, uh, power club came to see us, I don't know, about eight months, nine months before they went into market. Um, and they really wanted to understand what the best way they could, they could position themselves and communicate themselves when, when they actually launched. And so I went through a process there of, a, a, a re, like I would call it a traditional branding process, where we went and researched the marketplace, went to understand, you know, who's out there, who the competitors are, how consumers make decisions about churning their energy retail provider, all those sorts of things. And then once we understood that, we sort of got a position where we decided to work, we did a workshop, we decided to create a position for this brand around how it could actually compete against some of the more major brands, especially being a, an energy startup company. Um, it also has a very interesting, um, interesting business model, which is quite different from any other energy company. A little bit, there's a little bit of, um, of conversation around how to actually explain that model. I don't think it's as relevant in the branding and communications of it, but it was just a key thing we needed to consider in the way that we needed to communicate this brand once we hit the market. 
Um, so when we looked at it, we sort of, you know, looked at the tension. So we look at the big issues facing people when they think about their energy company. So tensions like energy retail is noisy. It's very, it's characterized by over complexity. Hey, you know, even they have a complicated product and that sort of generates quite a lot of inertia. So what happens is, is that what we found in our research is that while lots of people say they want to churn their energy company, the actual process or implement or follow through on that's really quite low. So we really needed to find a way to get cut through and move people through that inertia. Um, so we identified like a key purpose for the brand, like well, why, why should they exist? You know, you hear about the Simon Sinek golden circle and I think there's good value in looking at the, the how, the what and the why. But when I think of a why, I think of it as a because statement. So when we, when we used to do this sort of stuff, people used to go, we exist be, um, to do something. So like our purpose is to change the world. But I see that more as a strategy. So for me, a why starts with the word because. So why do we exist? So for these guys, it's because knowledge and choice empower action. So that's sort of how we sort of built that one out. So if you think about the tension, the tension is it's noisy and there's lots of inertia. Therefore, if we can bring knowledge and choice, we can get people to take action. And so then you look at the strategy and your strategy is much more of a two statement. So if you think about your high, again, it's similar to the Simon Sinek, the what, how, why. So we go, our purpose is a because statement and our strategy is a two statement. So in this case, it's to be the first challenger to the energy disruptors. Now, what's really interesting about that statement, if I break that down, and is this making sense, Will? Yeah, this is really good. This is really okay. good. So if you break that down, you know, to be the first challenger to, the, to energy retail disruption, when we look at the competitive market space for the energy market, one of the things we noticed is that it's already been disrupted. There already are disruptors out there providing en cheaper energy solutions or different energy products or direct access to the wholesale market or other ways to sell their energy. So they've already disrupted your big mainstay players. So what we're looking at doing is actually using the coattails of that sort of subcategory that I believe was already being created and really positioning ourselves against them. So if you're already, so think about that as a, from a marketing perspective, if you're already in market with the intent to move and you've been disrupted by a disruptor, then why can't we challenge one of those disruptors and pick off the customers that are already that much more active? Then we're way down the funnel and we've got the brand to take us down the funnel and the positioning to take us down the funnel, not the advertising. Does that make sense? Because that's a really important point about it. Dude, it's like, it's like, it's like disrupted inception. <laughs> like, yeah. like di disrupting, the, disrupting the disruptors, right? Yep. That's exactly where we wanted to position this. So it's like, if so think about it again, I'll say it again, because I think it's really important. It's a category versus consideration thing. Sometimes one of the things I've learned, and it's a little bit off topic from this um, example, but something I think people should understand is that sometimes you can borrow all the media and all the communications that a category has spent on establishing itself and just talk about consideration. So you let all your big companies out there tell people they should change their energy. And then what you do is you come in at the bottom going, so if you've gone through that process of thinking about changing your energy and you're about to do it, why do you think about us? So then you're just borrowing, you're borrowing all that spend up there and you're just focusing the positioning on that transition. So really it's a very end of funnel story, but just think about how I've done it. I've done it by thinking about how the brand positions in marketplace, not the advertising. So we build a whole brand, a whole identity, a whole communications in market that goes to pick people off as they're going through the decision-making process. It's fundamentally different to the way that many people think about branding. So that's building the brand to actually deliver an outcome to perform in its market space. So once we've got that, and that's just strategy, we haven't got to the identity yet. We're just talking about strategy. We start to look at the identity. We need to look at all of the attributes and characteristics, the values, the personality traits, the proof points of the brand that really ladder up to something that you can say. So this is about developing a value proposition. So once you've identified all that space, you've identified the vision, the strategy, the purpose, and that sort of conversation with the objectives in, you want, to look, you want to bolster that up through what you say in market. So that's the value proposition. And the singular essence or the big idea that sits at the heart of that proposition, or we call it an essence, for this brand was the idea of openness. So if I walk you through that process again, the first thing was energy retail is full of bullshit. It's over complex, full of inertia. If we can get knowledge and choice, if we can bring knowledge and choice to people, we can empower their action. We want to be the first, in, we want to be the first disruptor to the disruptors. And we're going to do that through an essence of being open, openness. That then forms a proposition, which is we want to be the people's innovator. We want to bring people innovation beyond the innovation. So that becomes like the proposition for it. So once we have that, we've got our brief. We've got a brief for creative, we've got a brief for communications. And so we take that and we translate that to 
the personality of the brand. So in this instance, the personality of this brand is very externalized. So it's very extroverted. It's very thinking. It's trying to bring new information to you. It's quite intuitive and it's very judging. It's very decisive. And so that if we apply, and I've just applied a, a very simple Myers-Briggs type personality to that, I've actually applied it as an ENFJ. And the ENFJ is a, a teacher or they want to inspire other people to do good in the world. So therefore you can actually create an expression out of that. So if I overlay what everyone uses in this in, in branding, you know, if we overlay an archetype to that, we can actually connect that archetype to the friend. So this brand wants to be your friend. And now we've got a place we can start. You can already start to see how this brand's going to sort of visualize in market. It's going to be friendly. It's going to be positive and it's going to do all great stuff. So from that, we identify the insight. Um, so now we're looking at communication. So from an insightful perspective, this is about a strat. We look at the insight. So we've gone to this inertia and then we're looking at this question. So the insight here is Australians are fed up and I'm reading it. Australians are fed up. Most of us trust our energy company less than our bank. Love how it's still less than our bank because I'm you know, yeah. in the bank. <laughs> it's like Australians are fed up. Most of us trust our energy company less than a bank. So that's the, that's the insight driving the idea in market. And then the idea in market turns up as a creative. And in this case, I'm going to just give you the tagline, which is save your energy for life. And so then you can code that tagline, save your energy for life into a friendly language, a positive tone of voice, bright colors, and very affiliated or friendly imagery. And so that's how the whole brand, I've just described very simply just how, how the whole brand comes together from that, the strategic insight, which is all around inertia, all the way down to a code, which is let's be friendly, let's use positive tone, bright colors, affiliated imagery, and tell everybody that you can save your energy for life with Power Club. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's yeah, right. awesome. No, no, I think, look, I think the way that you do it is so clever as well, because, uh, and you touched on this a little bit when you first started talking about, you know, we're targeting bottom of the funnel and letting the big brands spend their budget on the top of the funnel, right? And I think that's so clever how you, like, looking at it from that strategic viewpoint, because traditionally branding has been like, look, let's just get it to market, let's get awareness, and that's it, like, very top of funnel stuff. But I think the way that you're kind of doing it is you're building a brand that can target every stage of the funnel. Yes. I mean, that's the, that is the point. The other thing is, is like when I say bottom of the funnel, it's not, it's I'm placing, I'm placing the expression of that brand to be attractive to people who are further down the decision making funnel. So that's not to say that the brand can't operate as save your energy for life all the way at the top of the energy funnel, uh, sorry, funnel when it comes to energy. It's just that I know, and let's be honest, what is the point of targeting people to convince them and, and twist their arm that they should be churning their energy provider and they can get a better deal? If you already know that, then you should already have been overcome certain inertia points, especially with that observation in this marketplace. So therefore, you want to target the bottom end of the funnel and let even the regulator push people to shift their energy provider. So you see how you can use the category, the, all the activity of the category to drive consumer action. You don't need your brand to drive that consumer action. You can get your brand to drive other actions. Yeah, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it'd be good to dive into some of the numbers because obviously we run a lot of, you know, direct marketing campaigns, whether it's on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I really noticed you know, in the past, probably a month or two, is that the algorithms and the AI is getting so much better. Like, you know, the, the media buyers just can't keep up because the algorithms behind the platforms are just doing all of the media buying and doing it in such a smart way. So... Yeah. The, the thing that we're seeing is that brands that have a better brand presence or bigger brand presence or built their brand properly, their, their CPA, so their cost per acquisitions are actually dropping when, you know, when the algorithms are actually catching up. Yeah. It's really interesting that you kind of approach it this way. I mean, have you seen the same thing with, with PowerPoint? And it's, it's not surprising at all. So, in, you know, I think we're living in a time where you can just simply buy reach. It's so, it's, it's, I mean, I know it's crazy to say it, but it, it's easy to reach people. The reality is easy to reach doesn't necessarily mean easy to engage or easy to communicate to. So just building awareness from an ease of reach is, you know, like it's what is the definition of awareness? Is the definition of awareness the reach or is the definition of awareness actual recall? So when you play in that space there, I think you've got to start forgetting about reach for the sake of reach. You have to look at it in terms of recall. So for me, I think bigger and more um, more important sort of triggers or leading indicators are things like, you know, your organic or your direct inquiry. So like with a direct inquiry, it has come about because of brand recognition or brand awareness. So it's a pure, it's almost like a pure score around how many people still remember you and therefore go and seek you out. And it's quite active. So I think that they're better leading indicators than just a good old fashioned 
reach, which is we reached 3.8, you know, we got three, you know, 3.8 million impressions or whatever that number is. That aside, it's how many of those, how many of that turns up as people seeking you out? So it's that brand sustainability or that remembering of you in market that I think is more valuable or is a better leading indicator of the strength of your brand and how it's performing. Yeah, it, it's actually pretty funny how, how much, you know, how similar the, the message is and how we think about the market. Because, you know, when I, when I see companies that have worked with other agencies that have done purely branding before and they're like, look, we've reached 2 million people. I'm like, great. So what? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, a, a kid in his bed, a 14 year old kid in his mum's basement can reach 2 million people if he's got his mum's credit card, right? Like yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not hard to do. Uh, yeah. it's, it's what you do with that reach that actually matters. So it's really funny how you, you know, we're kind of come from two opposite ends of the spectrum, but we're talking the same language. Exactly. It's pretty cool. You've got to bring these things together. I think the other thing is, is like, you know, the, there is an old marketing saying, which is it's, it's about who you reach that matters, not how many people you reach. And so ultimately you're trying to influence and change people's behavior and you're trying to get people to, to, to take an action around your brand. It can't be done on just simple awareness alone. It has to go through a much more, and we talked about this before, a much more, a much more intricate and um, a much more integrated funnel. Like we talk about awareness, which is just that straight up reach and memory. Then we talk about understanding, which is, you know, do people really know what it is that you're offering? And then we talk about, you know, a, a conversion process which is, you know, when you get people into your marketing ecosystem, I don't think it's conversion as an acquisition process. I think of conversion as a level of interest that someone might have against you. I also think, and we've talked about this before, and I really like this analogy, which is you can be in conversion for a very, very long period of time. You don't have to be in conversion for five minutes. You could be in conversion for two minutes, but you could be in conversion for years. I'm still in conversion for a Porsche. You know, I've been in conversion for a Porsche since I was 11 years old. I still, I haven't got one and I still want one. That doesn't mean I'm going to get one, but it doesn't stop me from reading articles, looking it up, or looking at cool pictures of Porsches on Instagram. So I'm still in that, I would say I'm still in conversion. I'm not quite ready to be acquired, but that's the, the idea you've got to think about, which is I'll buy a Porsche when and if I can afford one, but you know, I'll, I'll, con I'll move through the conversion funnel into acquisition when I'm good and ready. So this is very much around really identifying how you can use your brand to support those buying the buying process. So if you look at that buying process, it's, can I get to you? Have you heard of me? Do you understand me? Are you interested in me? Are we ready to do business? Let's do business. Let's make it easy to do business. And then let's stay friends. So if you play, if you play that out in traditional funnel language, it's reach, it's awareness, it's understanding, it's conversion, it's acquisition. And then it's onboarding, which is a process of actually bringing people over and retention, which is at, which is looking for looking to turn people into advocates. So that's still a that's the, that's still marketing. You know, it goes back to the you know what they say the seven P's of marketing. You know, place you know place price blah blah blah. Not dissimilar. Nothing's changed. Mm. It, yeah, it, it, that, that's another funny point because um, you know with all the new technology coming up, I think very shortly the market's going to shift massively. I think that the the marketers who have, have a solid fundamental understanding of what marketing is and you know, it, it goes back to the seven p's and the basics it's it's purely just psychology right it's understanding what happens in your prospect or your lead's mind as they go through each of the steps and as they get more familiar with you um yeah. so I think, yeah it kind of comes back to that and you know it's kind of done a funny thing where it's split off gone into the branding thing where it's all about you know fancy images and videos that you don't really understand and somehow that's marketing but i think it's all coming back to, to the core of what it actually is and yeah. uh technology was kind of responsible for the expansion but I think as it kind of collapses back down to the core elements, that's kind of technology as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Look, I think at the end of the day, it's a combination of really good placement and quality content. And it's not quality content as in like, let's create content articles. It's just stuff that people want to look at and engage with and being, and being on, in the right place at the right time with that material. You know, and, and it's about people understanding who, it's getting that awareness and then people, and then moving them through to understand what is the offer and why you should be interested in it. And when you're ready to buy, here we are. Make it as easy as possible. And the technology is all there for us to do it. Easy, easy peasy at that end. Yeah, nice. Well, so, I was going to say one more thing. Yeah, sure. It, it's a lot easier. I believe it'll be a lot easier to do this in an integrated sense than a disparate sense. I think the traditional relationship model or agency model with a client is quite disintegrated. As in you have, you know, your performance people, your branding people, your creative people, your digital people, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, my view is, is you keep it simple. Try and bring these things under one thing. Everything needs to deliver the same outcome. Everything needs to have the same 
idea. It all has to come from the same place. If you can get it all lined up, then every activity that you're doing in market is actually building brand equity in market. So that's another point I think is really important for people. And that's that, you know, it's this idea that a brand is a perception held in someone's mind. That's it. That's the basic definition of a brand from my, from my point of view anyway. And so if it's a, if it's a perception held in somebody's mind, how is that perception formed? You know, it's formed by all the experiences and impressions that you have with it over time. So that means every interaction that you have. So by principle on that basis, everything you put in market reinforces your brand. Therefore your tactical activity is a branding exercise. An email is a branding exercise. A piece of content is a branding exercise. A phone call is a branding exercise. So therefore the way you answer the phone, what you say, how you say it, what it looks like, all reinforces who and what you are in market. Hence everything is communicating something, a little bit of something about who you are. So don't ignore that. Don't just say the objective of this piece of communication is to drive leads. It's no, the objective of the communication is to drive leads in a way that reinforces the brand. So hence, start with the brand, get it right, and integrate that into your communications. Then what you'll be doing is you'll be, you'll be building brand equity in market at the same time as driving leads. Yeah, that, that's super important. And if you, if you get it wrong, it can be you know, disastrous. If you get it right, it can be super profitable. Uh, it, it's a really funny story because I wrote um, a, a sequence of emails for a client one time. And this is you know, more of a corporate client, uh, in professional services, uh, and the, the, the copywriter or the new uh, agency that was uh, trying to undercut us they went in and copied one of my templates, but the template was for a startup. So the tonality was super different. And, um, you know, so it goes back to saying like, if you don't know your own brand identity, you're just going to take whatever, the, whatever shit's flying out there and yeah. try it, but it's not going to speak to the audience that you actually want to speak to. So yeah. I think that's a super important point that every single thing you put out into market interactions, that's all branding as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that, so, that's the point, which is, and so therefore, if it the almost, it's almost, you can almost do it by feel. So if, the, you know, and, and you're right, what you're actually writing when you're, pre when you're preparing those sequences is a piece of brand communications. You're representing the organization. You're sending that directly to somebody's inbox. And consequently, what you say is going to form an impression on those people. And many of those people have never heard of you before. It's going to form an impression. Therefore, that's why we work so well together. That's actually the reason is because your, 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 what you're writing is an, is a direct a direct reflection of your client's brand. And I'm worried about how that materializes in market because I want to make sure that not only do you get the positive outcome from the email itself from the sequence, but you also, if you don't get that positive outcome or that acquisition, you're still building positive equity so that they're not thinking badly of you. They're not going, that was a terrible impression. I never want to do business with that company. It's just, no, thanks very much, Will. I'm just not ready right now. That's fine. That's the outcome you want. Not, fuck, what is this shit? <laughs> Man, maybe I should move into branding. <laughs> but it is. Um, That's why I'm saying everything is branding. Everything. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So I think that was awesome. So let's let's kind of go through and what I want to do was a quick exercise, right? Like a like a quick theoretical exercise because we've talked about the startups, but I know that your core customer base are actually corporate. So you've worked with some huge companies you know, some of the um, would you say, I mean, biggest companies in Australia? They they'd be they be up there, right? Yeah, they're they're very large. I mean, one of our one of the clients that we've helped transform was um, was TAFE New South Wales, which is a government a government educator. It actually stands for Technical and Further Education. And um, when they consolidated, they used to have ten different institutes, and each institute would have you know fifty or sixty to a hundred thousand students. When they consolidated their eleven institutes, they ended up with half a million students. So if you think about the infrastructure around that, you know, not only do you have half a million students, you've got all the teachers all the infrastructure, all the, all the pieces around that. And so it probably affected over a million to 2 million people in one go. And that's, so that's, that's, so 10% of Australia's, um, of, of Australia's entire uh, population base is affected by this brand. And so really the, 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 this was a very different problem to the power club one. Yeah. This one's very much, and I wouldn't call it a problem, but opportunity to really bring the brand to life and shift it from what they would call a plan B to a plan A. And now what's really interesting, again, we've got to look at the insights. You've got to look at the context. So you've got to look at that sort of, um, you know, almost the, the you know, the, the, the cultural tension. And I think the cultural tension for, for TAFE being a technical business or a technical company, a technical training company and a, um, and a university, for example, is that there is a difference between what is, what, what, what is getting knowledge and what is getting skills. And we are a skills provider. And so if you think about it, this is a global phenomenon at the moment. Universities are struggling to, 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 to maintain their relevance in an environment where skills are becoming more and more valued. 
That's why Academy XI is doing really well. That's why these sorts of smaller skills-based organisations are really cutting the cutting the, 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 the heels of the of TAFE, which is the government-based version of it. So they wanted to retain that level of competitiveness, not only because the universities were coming down with skills-based education, but because brands like Academy were coming up and sort of cutting out, you know, nipping at the heels of TAFE. So we really needed a repositioning to make TAFE cool. So traditionally, TAFE's not a very cool thing to do. You sort of go to it because you didn't get into uni and you go to it because you're going to be a plumber or do some, some blue collar sort of stuff. That's one thing. The other thing is, is they've got, they've got the biggest footprint of education in Australia. They're the most highly connected educator. They can get people through. They deliver a, an outcome that's directly correlated between, you know, getting a, a skill and getting a job. So there's a lot more to TAFE. So bringing it together and making it, which effectively making it cool was what we had to do. So we had brought all these institutes under one TAFE and we relaunched that into the marketplace. So again, we went through a similar process by identifying that tension, defining its purpose, developing the strategy, executing on an essence, defining a proposition, and then identifying, you know, what is the personality of TAFE? What, how do we express that in market? What is the insight driving that expression? What's the idea in market? And how do we, what are the codes around TAFE? And so I think there's some good examples on our website of how TAFE ended up looking. And it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool for a, a very large government bureaucracy. It actually is because I've got a TAFE right in the email. Like I drive past a TAFE every single day on the way to work. And I remember um, this, this must have been uh, four years ago. Yeah, three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. Yeah, I remember one day I, I drove past it, and you know, it's it, it used to be so bland that you know, I'm not talking shit on tape, but the branding used to be just generic blue, like government blue. I called it, and you just drive past it, and you, you never think about it, right? And one day I drove past it, and they've got all these the, the new billboards, and I was like, oh shit, did the tape move out? Like, what happened here? Like, yeah. and it was actually tape. But you saw some jumping people. So one of the you know the key the, the creative is all about it's highly expressive. So therefore you've got people jumping for joy, you know, and, and the tagline was be ambitious because really it was about ambition. And so ultimately that's, that's how the TAFE brand sort of executes in market. And it's been great at getting cut through and it's a little bit more fun than university. Universities have to take themselves a little bit seriously, you know, because ultimately when you roll back the whole university story, you know, you're talking about universities as institutions or that, that are there to actually inform knowledge, create, you know, create space for, create, for new creativity, new thinking. TAFE's not about that. And weirdly, universities are trying to be about that, but they're not as vocational as the TAFE. You can play a lot more fun out of that TAFE brand. And you just, yeah, that's awesome. you know, it doesn't say the universities can't be fun. It's just universities are, it should be places of, 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 of thinking and places of creativity, places of knowledge. Very different. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So, so that was awesome. So we've got kind of two ends of the spectrum as an example, yeah. right? We've got the Power Club, which is startup, and then obviously TAFE, which is a big institution. Let's yeah. do a really quick exercise because I think most of the business owners listening to this podcast will probably be you know, doing two to maybe up to $20 million a year in, in revenue, let's, let's say. Uh, but for someone who's doing, let's just say, $5 million a year in revenue, their budget is probably, what, $50,000 a month in terms of marketing. Like, How would you do the brand plus performance bit? to make sure they get as much bang for buck with every dollar they spend as possible. Yeah, I think, I think the key, like I said before, the key thing here is you need to integrate brand language or your brand into every piece of communication that you do to reinforce and leverage that bang for buck. So essentially, every time you spend money in market, you get a bit of a spike. So if you're going to market with that spike and you're communicating to people, then you want to make sure that even if they're not ready to buy, they're learning something new about you. So that's the way you get the two things to do, that you get the two things in the one, in the one activity. Hence, you've got to think about what is it you're saying What's your call to action? What's your tone of voice like? What's your big idea? And how do you insert that? And we talked about that with the, the letter writing. It's like, how do you insert who and what you are into the way that you're going to write letters or the way you're going to buy, um, buy a programmatic um, or, or construct a programmatic ad or into a, into a communication or a message that's sitting inside that ad? And the way to do that, like I said before, it's a process of identifying what is the cultural tension that you're satisfying? What is the purpose? Why, why does the world need you? What is the strategy? How will you achieve that? Who are you? What is your essence? What is your personality? What are the attributes that mean that you can make that claim on the market? How does it translate to a value proposition? So i.e., what is the value that you're delivering that marketplace? And then once you've got that as a strategy, you can look at what is your identity? You know, what, what is your, your Myers-Briggs personality? How does that express in the marketplace? So if you, if you choose a personality trait that is expressive, then it's going to be very expressive. So therefore, it's going to be it's going to be a little bit more affiliated. It's going to have a lot more smiling people in photos. But if you choose one that's a little bit more caring, then maybe it's going to have less people in the photos. It's going to be less smiley. Like so, it's just around how you and that's really our that's our thing being able to to to, to translate all of that sort of stuff. But you know, that, these are just I'm just giving you hints around it. 
do some reading. You can get that stuff online. In fact, I've got a book that we've recently written that just decodes a couple of the brands that we've done. You know, if you're interested in having a, a, a little bit more of an understanding of that process of how it, get, how it gets done and how to decode, you know, send me an email. You can probably catch me off our website at uberbrand.com.au. Make a request and, and I'm sure we'd be happy to send you one of these, um, a copy of one of these books. Yeah, I've, I've had a sneak peek at the book and it's, um, it's awesome. It's really, really, uh, it, it's detailed, but not in a way that's like, uh, that's hard to digest. I think it's really actionable. It's a, yeah, I, I was really impressed by the stuff I've seen in it. So, um, so if you're listening to this or watching this, uh, do make sure that you head across the Uber website and, and send down a message to, to get the book. There's six really good case studies in it as well. Like, so there's a couple of really big brands. Um, across different categories and sectors, but there's also a couple of startups in there. So don't feel like you know we're we're catering just to the the high end of town. It's like the high end, the middle, and the and the small end, even startups. So check it out. Yeah, awesome, perfect. So so Dan, um, that was a really really cool episode, man. I've uh, we've got so much value out of that from both ends of the segment. And look, every time I talk to you about branding and performance, it's always you know, I always learn something new. So mate, thanks again for coming on. What's the best way for people to contact you if they if they want to get your help? Is it the website or Oh, you can probably find me on LinkedIn. So Dan Ratner on LinkedIn or on um, or, or straight through the website, uberbrand.com.au. Either way, you'll probably catch me. Cool. Perfect. All right. Thanks so much for coming on, Dan, and for sharing all of your knowledge. Uh, this has been awesome. Like, I, I, I love the conversation we have every single time because I think it's really talk about the future of marketing and the future of storytelling. So look, uh, I'm sure everyone listening got a whole bunch out of that. And then I'm going to have to get you back on again to talk about this down the path because it's always evolving. So uh, thanks again, mate. And I'll catch you soon. No worries, mate. Thanks for chatting.